Welcome to a review of a turntable. This one is from a Slovenian company called Holbo. And this particular turntable is interesting. It's different, it's quirky, it's exotic. It's exotic because it's an uh, bearing turntable. And it also includes a linear tracking arm that's included within the design. Now, this thing is priced, last time I looked, at £6,400, so it's high-end. But actually, it's not that expensive for this sort of approach, this sort of design approach, the sort of technology that we're talking about. £6,400 is... it ain't bad. A lot of ten tables featuring this sort of technology go off into the stars, so definitely worth a look. Now this is an archive review, so it's not quite the same as my normal reviews, such as, for example, the Degritter review I did last week, and I'll put a link up there if you want to have a look at that vinyl cleaning machine. But the Holbo I'm doing here is an archive review. Now, if you want to see how that's different and why, check out this link, watch around four and a half minutes, and it'll tell you all about it. But back to the review, and in fact, actually, Let's not go to the review just yet. Let's talk about the background to all of this. The air bearing, and especially turntables with linear arms, they haven't always gone right. They haven't always gone well. There's been lots of issues, problems. So let's take a little look at the technologies that Holbo is dealing with here. Holbo, I must add, has actually said, oh, it's not a problem. We've overcome all of those issues. But let's look at those issues and see the sort of problems that Holbo is facing here. There's been a raft of turntable and tone arm designs that have attempted to remove the lateral tracking error when tracing a vinyl groove. This error derives from the way the original cutting stylus does its thing. There's a perceived issue in terms of playing vinyl and how it's done. And the issue really goes all the way back to when vinyl is first cut on a lathe. This is the machine which cuts the initial grooves. It cuts them into a disc called an acetate, and that acetate is used further down the line to create the vinyl. But when those initial grooves are cut, it's cut by a stylus attached to a lathe. Now, the difference between a lathe cutting those initial grooves and your common or garden turntable, the way it plays those grooves, the difference is quite wide. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when you have a normal turntable, the arm performs and acts in a different way to that cutting lathe I mentioned earlier. So imagine you're standing up looking down on a turntable, and imagine my hand is your tone arm, and you've got your stylus on the very tip of my fingers there. So it pivots from my wrist, as it were, and using that pivot, it swings across in an arc. And you can see the turn, I mean, you can see yourself if you have your own turntable, you move the tone arm across, it traces an arc shape as it goes across the turntable. That's not how records are cut. Records are cut using a lateral system. So the cutting stylus on a lathe doesn't actually trace an arc, it moves like this. It actually moves in a parallel way, a parallel manner. It's a completely different way of cutting to playing. So this means the common playback turntable incorporates all kinds of angled tweaks, including overhang, offset, and the rest. Hence, you'll see tone arm head shells twisted a bit to run in the groove at an angle, and there are different tone arm tube shapes. Some tone arms are longer to minimize the angle error. The result is a very nice sound indeed, but it's never actually perfect. So you've got to ask yourself, if a linear arm moving in this direction, moving across the turntable, if that's the perfect system, how come all turntables don't have linear tracking arms? Why isn't that the default? Trouble is, lateral playback arms can be complex to design and build, and often incorporate a host of issues, such as hard-to-shift vibration. They can stutter as they go across 
the actual record. The mechanisms can wobble a tiny bit, and this all tends to negate the promised benefits. They can also be incredibly expensive and also unreliable. The forces placed on the lateral arm as it moves across the vinyl can also be an issue. It's an easy ask, oh yeah, but actually producing something that works and at a reasonable price can be tough. So that's one host of issues. There's another about using air to operate a turntable. By that I mean asking a turntable to move its tone arm on a bed of air. So you would move this linear tracking tone arm on a bed of air to reduce friction. But if you want to operate a turntable on a bed of air, where is the air going to come from? Well, presumably you'd have that air coming from a pump. But how big is this pump going to be? And how much will it cost? And how noisy is it going to be? And does it need to be in a separate room to keep the noise down? Is it going to overheat? Do you need some sort of filtering? Will it go out of alignment? Will the connected hoses, will they even stay in place? Air bearing turntables can be finicky to set up and use, but this model from Holbo promises to remove that hassle and allow you to quickly set up and dive straight into your vinyl. More than that, in addition to moving the tone arm on air, the Holbo also places the platter on air too, using an air bearing. The platter can only be moved when the air is being pumped underneath the platter. Otherwise, it remains in place and quite immovable. Spanning 430 millimeters by 400 by 150 millimeters and weighing a healthy 12 kilograms, the MDF plinth supports an aluminium platter. Around the rear are all the connections for the supplied air pump. And that weighs 1.8 kilograms and itself spans 225 millimeters by 147 by 120 millimeters. You also get a power supply and a phono cable. There's a dual speed toggle switch and a suite of fine adjustment speed pots. There's a DC motor holding the belt because this is a belt drive mechanism. Basic engineering actually is pretty good. The turntable is quite solid and that turntable in operation is quiet at the normal listening position. The supplied air pump is also very quiet. The arm itself can be adjusted for azimuth, leveling and vertical tracking angle. It also features a steel tube and aluminium base and carbon tube construction plus silver copper lits wiring. An installation gauge is supplied to help with the setup. Attaching the pump with the supplied air tube is very easy indeed and has a little collar screw to attach it to the rear of the turntable. Everything else arrived to me installed and besides the addition of a cartridge, belt and checking the tone arm position, which is something you would do on any other turntable, there was nothing more to be done in terms of setup. So the potential hassle messing around with pumps and hoses and goodness knows what else, Holbo has removed all of that. The actual installation is incredibly simple, especially for an air bearing system with a linear tracking arm. It's about as plug and play as you're going to get. Before I look at the turntable, a quick word about the manual, and that word is the I see this a lot. One man band company concentrates on the engineering, but loses sight of the importance of the support materials. The manual itself is a cure its egg, good in places. There are some nice annotated images here, but nowhere near enough of them. The manual, a few sheets of A4 paper stapled in the corner, needs a lot more hand holding and explanatory text. There's also too many assumptions here on behalf of the company. As if the company has said to itself, the public knows this, so let's skip through this bit with a bullet pointed list. Well, no, never assume, especially in hi-fi. For example, I had myself, I had a query about the fact that I couldn't move the platter at all. Was this because of the air bearing technology or was there some sort of transport lock actually somewhere around the turntable that I couldn't find? I received a panic stricken reply entreating me not to move the platter because of the air bearing thing, yet there was no warning of the same anywhere in the manual. Yet it was the first thing I thought about after unboxing. 
There's also lots of bits and bobs in this box that can cause confusion to a beginner. So the manual eh, could do better. And relating to that, there's not a great deal of installation advice for this particular turntable. For example, the tracking weight at the rear of the arm. There's not a great deal of information for that. This is a separate piece that screws onto the straight arm tube. So, does it matter what angle you set it at? The company seems to secure its weight downwards. But there was no discussion about the pros and cons of alternative angles and if they made any sort of sonic difference. And I also want a more background discussion on the technology of the arm itself, and I didn't get it. The included feet are made from acetal POMC and can be used for levelling, which is good. Trouble is, when placing the plinth on your shelf, the three support feet feature protruding spikes in the centre, which can damage your shelf surface. The manual offers a one-line warning about this buried in one of those bullet point lists I mentioned. So you need to place protective supports or discs under each foot. And I would have liked to have seen some freebie support feet from Holbo, and I didn't get any. They only have to be cheap and cheerful just to prevent damage to your shelf. As it is, I recommend if you get this turntable, table, grab yourself three little support feet, ideally with a little dimple hole in the top to take the spikes from the turntable's feet, just to give us some fixed support. Once I got the turntable up and running, I noticed that the speed was a little off. So at 33 and a third, it was off by about one RPM, I would say. Now on the rear of the plinth are two pots, and these can be easily adjusted to change the speed. And you will need a little micro screwdriver to do that. But would you believe it? There's no micro screwdriver included in the box. Holbo doesn't supply it. And it really needs to because not everybody has a micro screwdriver in their kitchen drawer. I had one, but I'm a reviewer. Again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It could just be something cheap and cheerful just to get the job done. There doesn't appear to be any warning that there's no interconnects included with the turntable either. I can't see anything to that fact on the website, so be warned. You will need to invest in a spare pair of RCA cables plus a ground wire. Okay, so let's say you've got all of that sorted and those little quirks have been corrected. Once you actually get this turntable up and running and you lower the arm onto your turntable, do it gently, do it slowly, because there's no damping on this linear tracking arm. It just comes down with a thud. So when you're using the arm lift, bring that arm lift down very gently. Personally, I actually ignored the arm lift and just used my fingers. I found that was actually preferable, but you might prefer the arm lift. It's there as an option. So how does this thing actually sound? Because what we've got here is a turntable that's easy to install. I know there's a few little quirks, but they're not major issues. They're a little bit irritating, but once you get all the little accessories you need, it's fine. But you've got this relatively, I say relatively low cost turntable, low cost in terms of what it can do, low cost in terms of the inherent technology. In those terms, the turntable itself offers good value, it seems. And also it's pretty easy to install. Surprisingly so, I would say. So given all of that, how does that actually sound? I began with a touch of Peggy Lee and the album called Raindrops. And from that album, raindrops keep falling on my head. Here, Lee was backed by a full orchestra. My first impression was how well the Holbo tackled the upper frequencies. Lee's vocal was nicely presented. Her light delivery, somewhat tremulous at times and wispy, was easily tracked by the Holbo, which also illustrated her slight vibrato with insight. The flute on the left channel can be too elusive for some turntables, but there was plenty of information on offer from the Holbo from the humanistic flow of the air through the instrument, full of micro mistakes and texture, to the rush of air during emphasis, the Holbo was able to present delicate information with some aplomb. The treble was similarly presented. The stroking of a bank of bells on the right channel sounded positively delicious. 
The halbo pushed the boundaries to the soundstage left and right and created an enlarged space which allowed the instruments to roam freely, adding to the amount of detail reaching the ear. Hence details swirled around the backing orchestra from the tonality of the brass section to the twangy electric guitar that sat underneath the vocal. Bass was certainly present here. It wasn't too weighty, didn't sound overbearing at all. It was nicely integrated into the mix actually. Remember I mused about the tracking weight at the rear of the arm and how it might affect performance? I decided to mess about with the angle and there were sonic differences depending on the angle I chose. So let's remind ourselves the company prefers the weight at the back of the tone arm to sit in a six o'clock position. So I reverse that and I move the weight all the way up to the 12 o'clock position. The sound quality change was not massive. It was subtle, but it was there. The effect was to add a slight hardness to the upper mids and treble. A light shining upon these areas that accentuated precision, but maybe a little bit too much. So I changed the position again, and this time I moved it to the three o'clock position. But I found the music to be a little bit on the dry side. It sounded sterile, I suppose and lacking in any sort of life. So then I moved the weight to the nine o'clock position, which is the direction of travel of the arm itself. And that's where I hit pay dirt. The upper mid treble accentuation was removed and there was more air and space in the soundstage, plus new reverb attached to the vocal delivery. Hence, if you're gonna use the Holbo yourself, I would strongly recommend that you twist the weight at the rear of the arm to the nine o'clock position, same direction as the travel of the arm. I then wondered if I could enhance the imagery at all, so I drafted in an HRS ADL stabilizer, which sat over the center spindle. Now when I review turntables, sometimes I like to tweak them a little bit if required and if warranted. And I wondered about the hollow bone, I wondered if it may benefit with a stabilizer or clamp over the spindle. So I reached for a stabilizer from the American company HRS, which includes anti-vibration technologies. And I listened to the Holbo with this stabilizer in place. With the HRS stabilizer called an ADL, with that in place, I thought it added depth to the soundstage and also added the ability for the Holbo to separate the soundstage into layers. On the left channel, before I added the stabilizer, I thought the orchestral strings and flute merged into one another far too easily. Adding the ADL helped to separate the two into distinct sections. Now, if you know HRS, you will know that they offer two flavors of their stabilizer. There's the ADL, and L stands for light, and also the ADH, and H stands for heavy. I wouldn't go for heavy, I would stay with light on this particular one, the ADL, if you're gonna use the stabilizer at all. I think the ADH is just too heavy. It's too damping. And I'm also a little bit wary about the pressure it puts on the air bearing turntable itself, on the bearing underneath the platter specifically. I then played a slice of The Cure and the LP Pornography. I was impressed with the Holbo's balanced neutrality. Again, the space and air around the soundstage enhanced the size of the presentation, while the sheer amount of information on offer was pretty impressive. Bass impact, the force and power behind the methodical percussion within the track figurehead, was not gut moving, but did offer great character, remaining satisfying in terms of its impact upon the track. You know, it's nice to use an air bearing turntable, one that works and works very well indeed. Also one that doesn't require an engineering degree to set up and also one where you can tweak it a bit. The Holbo's sense of balance and neutrality means that the music speaks for itself. There's no color here either. More than that, the Holbo sounds rather lovely with its upper frequency finesse and lower frequency character. In short, the Holbo turntable picks up the detail from the grooves as is. And what more can you ask from a turntable? 
Personally, I think this is a brilliant little turntable. Sure, it's going to cost you a pretty penny, but for the technology it uses and the way it puts them together, the ease of installation, the tweakability, the sound quality, it's a great value for money package. And that's me done for this review. Thank you very much for sticking with me in this video right to the very end. Much appreciated. Thank you too for all your support and for helping this channel to grow. And if you haven't already, please click on the like and also the subscribe buttons. Again, just helps to keep this channel ticking over. There's a host of social media links in the description below, along with my Patreon link, which features some exclusive editorial, which you're welcome to check out. Also, please visit my website, which has a host of material that never actually makes it to the channel. There's all kinds of goodies on there. I would love to have your company. So until that time, bye-bye for now.